before we formally start the training, there are some training prerequisites, and I think you have fulfilled most of the tasks. Uh, but I want to briefly um, go over with you. So before we start a training on the Naya microscope, we expect the users to have some experience or practical experience and knowledge about TM operation. And also I'd like to see them have practical operation of a STEM aberration corrector, um, which means being trained on the ARM microscope at ASU because the Naya microscope is dedicated to scanning transmission electron microscopy. And also since we will soon have both EUs and EDX on the Naya microscope, so some basic knowledge is required. They at least uh, need to know why they want to do EUs or EDX on the Naya versus doing EUs or EDX on other ASU microscopes. Uh, and other simple questions is, for example, what is the effect of voltage in TM and STEM experiment? How to minimize the beam damage? General idea of I5B samples. Also sample contamination, which is not very often, but it happens sometimes even on the nine microscope. So I expect the user to know this and have some rough idea how to deal with it. After baking in a vacuum chamber, before loading to the microscope, some samples will still contaminate. So doing some beam shower uh, in the nine microscope also helps to stabilize the organic molecules to be like a graphitic layer so they don't move around easily. So those questions should be uh, well understood. So those are some basic information. Now, I want to briefly introduce you to the nine user phase. Uh, probably you have heard about it that if you operate the nine microscope, you will be similar to to what you are doing here, you see it on a computer and you operate the microscope, use your mouse. And what is the difference is now you're watching my training slides and in a, in a real session, you are watching the operating interface, which is exactly the same. I just took the screenshot. So this top screenshot is a portion of the of a nine control software, we call it AS2. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, you can see uh, it's not very clear here, but the software name is AS2 Control Manager. So it's kind of a lower level control software, which provides you access to control each optical element in the microscope. But because there are so many optical elements, they group them together and define some functions for you to easily remember and operate. In particular, they group a, uh, a category of functions in the top of the screen showing as a taskbar. And you can see it's very long. So I will go through them from the left to the right. So they are so long that I have to cut them into two segments. So this top line is one segment, this bottom, this one is another segment, but in the instrument, they will appear a uh, of, as a whole horizontal bar line. So on the top left, you can say uh, it is the status. This is the main status of the microscope versus like uh, in a normal TM, you, you have gang valve. When you click gang valve, you can open the gang valve so you can see the beam uh, on the phosphor screen or the beam will go through your sample or you can close the gun valve so the gun is protected from vacuum, from potential vacuum leak in the sample region. So it's kind of similar here. So we have standby and be mount mode. So when you finish your experiment or you're leaving your experiment for a long time, you are always collecting standby. So that is the standard status of the microscope where it should always be 
when nobody is using it. So standby mode uh, is similar to what you have closed gang valve on other microscopes. Because we have a cold field emission gun, although we are in a very high ultra high vacuum, there are still tiny amount of molecules. So over time, those molecules will adsorb on the cold fact tip and reduce the emission capability of the tip. So over time, we need to flash the gun tip to remove such contaminations to maintain the high beam current. So you will see that if you don't do the flashing after two hours, the current will be very, very low as compared with the freshly flashed content. So you need to understand that this is an intrinsic characteristic of cold field emission gun. So you need to flash every two hours or actually on our microscope, it's better to flash every one hour because if you look at the gun current change over time, you will see it's very stable or nearly maybe like just reducing 10% from 100% to 90% in the first hour. And then it can quickly drop to 50% in the next hour. So if you want to always have the high beam current condition, you, you should flash every one hour. So that's a very basic knowledge. And then you can see on the, this part, you can see um, something like a diagram showing different parts of the nine microscope. And you can see the green color, which means good. Green, which means the vacuum level is at the level they expect. If they are slightly off, for example, if your sample is dirty and it's contaminating the chamber, I will first show in yellow. Yellow means warning, means the vacuum is not as expected, but it's not so bad. If it's so bad that the color will change into red. So you need to pay attention if in the column part, you see some yellow or red color. In the side pipe, you can see there is a red color. This is the peripheral pipe and it's isolated from the chamber. So you don't need to worry about this red segment. There are some hidden panels here we don't normally use. And when you are working on a microscope, you're welcome to click and try what is hidden. Now this panel is monochromator. So I think you probably have some basic knowledge of what is a monochromator and what is the function of a monochromator. And probably you don't know what we can get using this monochromator. I can tell you we can easily get down below like 15 milli electron volt under 60 kV and 100 kV by dedicated alignment and some a little bit of patience, you can get down below 10 milli electron volt. And then if you choose 60 kV, you can maybe reach eight milli electron volt but it depends on your level of operation skill and experience. You can see the slate has two status. One is in, the other is out. So the monochromator is always running with a certain level of current. They want to stabilize the current to stabilize the heat in the system so that they have no temperature drift of the electronic components. So, when you choose in and out, you're just uh, controlling a mechanical blade where you cut a portion of the electron beam to reduce the energy spread. So it's a physical step, not changing current step. So you need to understand this. Actually, that is the idea of how to make sure the system is stable. Then we will go to this panel. It's reads detector mode since you're already trained on the ARM microscope. I will try to introduce those with comparison to the other microscope. We'll see those three choices, Brightfield, CCD, EOS. They are changing what? Actually, if you think of similarity on the ARM microscope, you are changing the camera lens 
on the ARM microscope. But because this microscope is specialized and dedicated to STEM, so they just to define a few specific camera lens and name it as bright field mode, CCD mode, and EOS mode. So you can take it as they are just a particular value of camera lens if you're thinking about other microscope. And then similar to what you have on other microscope, you can choose what detector you want to use. So we have two positions. When I say two positions, I mean two motors controlling the, the insertion and retraction of the detector. You can see this HADF. It's a dedicated controller, so you can always take HADF in and out. However, there's another motor driving this detector. On this position, actually, you have two cameras. One is called MADIF detector, medium angle annular dark field, or a bright field detector. You cannot use both because they are on the same blade. You can only choose one of them, but you can always choose HADIF and bright field or medium angle. So these are separate. Also, the put another after controller here you can see it's called use after so on this use after there are uh, several positions depending on the status because sometimes some user want to change those after so the status might be different but generally we have two millimeter five millimeter and annular after and slot after yeah those are basic ones but they want to change so you can also change if you really need. So that's something we can discuss about if you need. And then you can see on this position, it reads afters. And then if you read the label, it says VOA. So what is VOA? If you think of other microscopes, it's equivalent to condenser afters, like C1, C2, C3. So VOA is just the one condenser after. If we think about the position of VOA, actually it's a C1 condenser after. If we look at the diagram and compare to other TM microscopes, we're actually in the C1 after position. And MOA is a special after in the monochromator. So that is something unique. So it selects the optical beam in the monochromator to improve the energy resolution. So you can also take it in and out to see how it is selecting part of the beam. Here, I have a question. It's a very simple question. Why we need those actors? Yeah, what's, what is their function? So you're trying to cut off the parts of the beam that don't have a uniform phase so that you minimize the aberrations once you've corrected. Okay, so yeah, that, that is correct. Uh, but uh, there is a one additional point I want to add. The main point of having an aperture, if we describe it using technical terms, is we are limiting the convergence angle of the beam. This angle actually is a very important technical parameter. That is why in most of the papers today, if they use STEM or STEM EOS, they always say we use a convergence beam with convergence half angle alpha equals 20 milliradians, 25 milliradians, 30 milliradians, or 33 milliradians. So those actors are just the one way to form such angles. So you need to know that they, they mainly want to reduce the angle and then it has the effect you, you are saying cutting off the unwanted electron beams. Then if you go to this part, you can see a probe. This means the convergent beam or the, uh, or the setting uh, on other microscopes of the beam form through C1, C2, C3 and, and all the afters you selected. And here, you can see there's a setting and there is a little triangle. You can click it, it will show you a range of different convergence angles, like one meta radius, 10 meta radius. But normally, for a normal purpose, 
you will only use 19 milliradians that's 20 i for tuning the system and then you want to do atomic resolution imaging as the color skews so you go to 30 milliradians 1i which is a low beam current or 33 milliradians 1i also a low current or 33 milliradians 10i with a higher current so depending on your need you choose the convergence angle then you have the choice of post specimen one. And you can see that normally we have a standard setting. Camera lens is 21 milliradians. You can also change to other values, but you need to know what they mean. This actually post specimen one is very similar to the protector system on other microscope. For example, ARM microscope. So they are controlling the values of four projector lens to give a camera lens. So it is very similar to the other microscope. What is different is that on the NIO microscope, the actual camera lens is not only defined by the post specimen one setting, it is also defined by another module post specimen two and you can see that here are tuning tuning actually is the ccd here so there is some software back they don't show the exactly the same but you you need to know the it's ccd here if you choose ccd here it's tuning here actually here is more important you need to make sure this is tuning actually when you see ccd here the camera lens is wrong you will see weird things happen. You need to make sure what is back here. Also, you can click use. Click here where uh, my mouse is showing, and then this will change to use. So you can see that the real camera lens is defined by four project lens, and then another module here. That's the situation on this nine microscope. But in principle, it's just two modules to control camera lens. The camera lens is still the same, but it's just you have an additional module, give you more flexibility to define your experimental condition. So that's why some people think this line microscope is complicated and hard to operate. It just gives you, you are just shown with more options. Sometimes you get confused, but uh, they are also grouped together, so you don't need to go to a, a lot of details. You can just stay with the basic, and then you, you can do experiments. Uh, you don't need to worry about too many things. Here is the use options. And you can see the camera is standard because we only have one camera, which is the direct electron dactris detector. And then the main parameter for use is EV per channel. And currently it is showing 0 0.900. It means 0 0.9 EV per channel. If you click this small triangle, you can see a wide range of choices from one milli electron volt per channel up to 1.5 volt per channel, EV per channel. Yeah, so a, a wide range. So you need to choose it depending on your experiment need, right? If you want to measure phonon, you want to choose one milli electron volt per channel. Uh, if you want to measure some band gap information, you want to choose maybe 0 0.01 EV, which means 10 milli electron volt per channel. If you want to do some good resolution colors, maybe 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and if you want to do a mapping covering a lot of elements, you maybe go to 0 0.9 or 1.5, yeah, depending on your need. Here is another small panel setting. It shows protector lens, and there is a small triangle. You click this triangle, I will show you different camera lens. This is redundant to this part in the post-specimen one, so it's just a redundant. And then this part is the stage. It shows what stage is in the microscope. For example, this stage uh, is called fixed tilt number 24. 
and here is the sample information you tap. And then here are two buttons. If you click, I will show some window. If you click navigation, you will see this we uh, this small window some uh, sample navigation. Yes. If you click exchange, it will show this window. You can see that there are numbers one, two, three, four, five. You have possibility of having five holders in the microscope being able to be loaded to the column depending on your need. Okay, and then there are some extra panels which you rarely use, sample notes and support. So this is for when you call Neon, probably you won't need to call Neon. So I usually call Neon, then they ask me to provide them access. I, I click invite and status status. Basically, these are the task information or panel information for the AS2. It's mainly about the hardware part on the nine microscope. And it's just a task bar. If you look at this part, this is actually the main software interface of the AS2 control manager. You can see uh, there are a few uh, menu, like file. When you click file, there will show up some options and edit data setting hardware window and help. I draw a dash circle here telling you that you need to frequently click window because sometimes you can click the X to close those windows. How you get those windows back, you need to click window and select those windows. So I want to briefly introduce you to those windows, which you will frequently use. So let's start with the right one, sample exchange. At the beginning, you will not be trained to handle the sample exchange. I mean, taking the magazine out and put a new magazine in this task. So somebody else will do it for you. So after this step is done, you can click a number, for example, country number one, fixed to 24, CDS code is inside the microscope. And you're done with it. How do you change to number two? Suppose so number two, DD31 is your sample. You just move your mouse over this number two and left click, and then something will happen. This part will show the procedures it will take to finish this sample exchange. Actually, there are many steps involved, but it's simple. You just click two, and then it will take about seven minutes to finish this procedure. This is sample navigation. You can see the stage control information. If it's a fixed tilt, you have X, Y, Z, which means movement in X, Y, and Z high direction. If it's a double tilt holder, it will enable alpha and beta so you can tilt the sample based on need. And sometimes you want to save sample location. So you can click this place, click new, new position and rename it like one, two, three, and then click save. It will save the sample location. If it's a double tube holder, it will also save the alpha and beta in this point. So for example, you, you're done with sample two, you move to sample three, but you save the location on sample two, and when you're done with sample three, you go back to sample two, you can click go and go back to the same location. There is some hysteresis, which means we will switch the holder and and move back, the, the real value will be different. For example, if you were exactly on zone and you do something, move aloud or go to another holder and you come back and load this, save the position and tilt, you will say, okay, it's not exactly on zone anymore. It's off by two degrees. Yeah, you should expect that. Yeah, that's the mechanical problem. They are not so precise to restore to the exact same mechanical status. Okay, let's continue the window. So this window where I'm uh, circling using my mouse is called tuning parameter. It is a panel defining how you want to control the parameters used for the automatic aberration measurement. So if we think about the aberration in a round lens system, 
right? So those values are unknown and you need to find it out. If you want to like find it out using your, your eye, yeah, you can correct the lower order values like the astigmatism using a runtigram or hopefully you can also correct coma to a certain precision. But if it is beyond that, it's very hard for you to judge the, those aberration coefficients from your eye. So we need to have a program to help us. So the NIOM software, they use a special kind of tuning algorithm. They try to take an amorphous carbon and tilt the beam to different angles and then matter how the image of the amorphous carbon is distorted at different angles. And then they try to calculate the aberration coefficients from this. So actually it is similar to what the Titan microscope is mirroring the aberration coefficients, but the Titan is mirroring it in the TM parallel beam mode. But here in the NIO microscope, we're using a convergent beam. So we are trying to correct the aberration coefficients in a probe mode. You want to define how large tilt angle you want to matter or go to to correct the aberrations because as the beam goes to larger and larger angles the aberration effect will be exaggerated so that's why we want to define how far we want to go and that means so in this panel you can say you don't define the angle directly the software tries to ask you what spatial resolution you want to go to like I typed in 70 picometer here, and then the software will calculate based on the voltage you choose, the maximum angle you need to go to. Here it calculates 32 milliradians. So the software will inform the aberration measurement software to tilt the angle to such region and measure the aberration coefficients. And then after measurement, they will try to calculate the residue error. So they try to calculate residue coefficients in the second order, third order, fourth order, and fifth order. And if you click correct, they will automatically update those values to see what is left. And then there are some other parameters. We rarely change those, but it's good to know that those are important. If somebody happens to change it to the wrong value and you never even look at this, you will get into trouble. So I want to reach you for the third order, we really define outer and goes 30. And then for a patch, we use a negative value of negative 1000. And for order five, we use 45. And for the patch, it's a negative 1000. So normally you only change this required resolution and this should be kept the same. So you can take a note on that. So let's move on to another window, CL setting align. This window is used to align the condenser system. So we normally use this window when we use a condenser setting other than the 19 milliradian standard reference. So say if you go to 33 milliradians and then you want to align the condenser probe, you want to use this window. There is a concept here. When we say a setting, you, you already see that on the tax panel, you already see settings like probe setting, right? 19 milliradians and maybe other setting values. I want to basically introduce you the philosophy of the AS2 software so you can see that there are too many can choose right so they try to group several can choose together based on their function say those controls work together to define a special operating mode and they just name it a mode like condenser probe mode 19 milliradians 20i here they just define the values for the condenser lenses C1 value current, C2 value current, and C3 value current. Those are current saved in the mode. 
And then you want to say, okay, what if those three values did not produce the effect I want, which means there are something that you need to compensate for, but only compensate for such combination of C1, C2, C3 values. So you can attach a control to this setting. And then they are grouped together. So when you change, it will only affect this mode, or which means the compensation value is saved in this mode. And when you switch to other modes, the compensation is different. Or if you don't have a compensation, the compensation is zero. Okay, now I want to get back to this CL setting a line. So what it means, the advantage of this window is it will link to the compensation in each unique probe mode. So you will save such values in the probe mode and not affecting others. Okay, so that's the rough idea. So you want to say there are universal names, like how, how do we compare? So yeah, let's go down to a particular optical element like C1 value, right? And you can define C1 value and define a different combination in the 19 milliradians and 33 milliradians. If you change C1 universally, it just changed the setting. It's not saved, it's a temporary change. And then if you change it in the 19 milliradian setting, it will be saved in the 19 milliradians. And then when you switch to other modes, it will not affect relative to each other. So that, that is the idea of grouping control values into different regions. So let's quickly go through. This is EUS dipole. So it shows a name, EM60Y, EV per channel. So those are changing to particular controls in the EUS mode. And then this is a monochromator panel. You can see the label MC11DX, MC11DY, and other optical components. Those are very important values for uh, aligning the monochromator. The reason why it is here is because monochromator is not very stable. You need to constantly update those values in particular MC11DX. I will constantly move around. So you will have to like bring it back using MC11DX. Okay, and then this is the most frequent panel probe. Actually, if you look at it, Defocus, this is Z height. You change the defocus by changing Z height. So it is a mechanical movement. That is the recommended option when you want to focus on your sample, when you want to focus for tuning and all kinds of functions. Uh, when you can only use fine focus when you have everything ready, you don't want to move the sample to produce drift you can change fine focus with a tiny amount, otherwise you will bring some aberration. And then you can hand tuning the aberration, lower outer values, a stick AB, coma AB, threefold AB, and C after AB. This is changing the position of the VOA after. And then on the left side are two panels showing some frequent controls of the use. So mostly if you just do call loss use, you don't need to go to the higher outer, which is showing the use tuning panel. You can only use the lower order. So in, in the tuning part, you, you can see ZLP tear. This is actually moving the zero loss peak to the correct zero loss position. If you do use on other places, you have some of controls to bring the peak to the to make sure that the strongest peak is showing at zero EV. And then if you are doing call loss, you tap a value in the loss prism here to bring the peak you want into the Dactris camera so you can record the peak. Okay, so with that, I think we are done with introducing the AS2 control monitor. You can think of the software as the virtual control knob on the ARM microscope where I can define the experimental condition. Let's now move to the data collection software. Think of this as the digital micrograph. 
you can look at this interface. This is called Nyan Swift or Neon Swift. You have installed on your own computer. So I guess you already are familiar with this software basic setup. You also have a few menus. And I want to emphasize window, right? When you click window, you see a lot of window options. And then if you choose them, it will show up on this right side. Like here is Dectris Ella camera control. This is the panel controlling the EOS camera information. And then here is a Ranchi camera control. It's controlling the CCD camera for looking at the Ranchi gram. And then there are some special multi acquire modules for data collection. And an essential part is the normal working space. And you can divide into smart windows. And you, you have options to show CCD camera or show an ADF image or show the EOS spectra or EOS camera image. So those are the live data or showing the recorded data here. And on the left side is the data navigation part. You can see once data are saved or acquired, it will show up here. This Swift software has a lot of bugs because it is still very young, but the the advantage is it is open source, so it is constantly under development um, with community efforts. The major issue of this software is it does not give you a very good automatic naming convention. So you need to always define a clear name for the data you care about. For example, you can take your notes on your notebook. What is 003 and type in 003 in this nine switch. So you can match the experimental condition and the, the name in the Swift. So that, that is something interesting because once you process this data, for example, you acquire a 10 U spectra and you sum them together into one spectra, right? So you acquired this 10 frames one hour ago, and then you do a summation now I will show the position of the sound image in now. So it will be grouped together with some new data. So you lost the connection. So that is something you need to pay attention to. Okay, I think this is enough for the introduction. So this slide just covers the basic AS2 control manager, which is the hardware control interface, and the Nyan switch, which is the data collection software. You can think of it as a open source digital micrograph. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so internet camera. There are two internet cameras to watch the status of the stage. For example, this camera is showing what is inside the microscope column. You can see this part and this part, these are the pole piece of the objective lens. And in the middle is the fixed field holder. Another right is showing an image as a rod. So this rod can go in and out, and then they can grab a sample holder or release a sample holder depending on the position. So this is another internet camera to watch the beam in a monochromator. Because aligning the beam in a monochromator is so complicated, they need a mechanism to help them to find the beam. So this is a special camera where you can see the slit. It has in and out, but it has a third position. It is called a slit camera. It's usually hidden, so you don't always see it, but it's a low level alignment, which users normally don't do this, but I kind of introduce you. You can just uh, know this is there. So in the slit, motor drive, there are actually three positions. You can put monochromator slit in, you can put monochromator slit out. You can also choose a slit camera. It will help you to find out the beam. So normally after the voltage change, this beam will be lost. So I normally put in this slit camera in and using this MC11QX module to find the beam. You don't need to do this part. It's a lower level alignment, but it's something I always do when I do voltage change. Okay, here is a diagram. You will see this poster in the nylon microscope room. I want to briefly introduce this to you. 
because you have seen the software side interface. Also, you need to have a sense of understanding of a mechanical and the design of the microscope. Let's go from below. From the lower side is the nylon microscope cold field emission gun. And then this is some gun lens parts. It is part of the gun. And then it's the monochromator. You can see the beam is going from the gun and going to a circle. Those are the energy dispersing unit and energy bending prisma. And here's the monochromator slip position. So the beam goes this way and goes back here. And then you can see the condenser lens one, two, three. And you can see the position of the wheel A after is here, it's after condenser one and before condenser two and the monochromator after is here. Okay, so after the three condensers is the aberration corrector, so it will have forming an atomic size convergent probe. And then the probe will be focused on the sample in the objective lens part. And then after that, you have four projector lens, one, two, three, and four. So those are similar to the other microscope. The difference is you can see that after for projector lens, you see the position for the HUD. Now you will clearly see that the convergent angle, the collection angle of HUD is totally defined by the projector lens one, two, three, four. If you change the module, which is called DQCM, they won't affect the collection angle of HUD. So when you change DQCM setting, for use or CCD or tuning mode, it doesn't affect HADIF. So you can always have a well-defined collection angle for HADIF in use mode, tuning mode, and other modes, because they're only defined by this for projector lens. And this DQCM acts as another module to change camera lens to define the angles on the bread field, medium angle, on the grungy gram, and on the use. So this is the EOS after. You can see that it is after the CCD and before the EOS after. It is before the entering part of the EOS spectrometer. In the EOS spectrometer, it has five layers of optical elements to correct the aberrations of the beam entering the EOS bending magnet. And then after the energy dispersion, you will have some other modules to correct the chromatic aberrations and the beam. And then you have magnifying optical elements to define the energy dispersion. So you have one melee electron volt per channel, you have one EV per channel, they are defined by combination of EM settings. And then we have the Dectris Ella camera here. I want to introduce you briefly about the sample exchange. You can see this rod, it is helping picking up the holder in and out and this is the magazine chamber. So normally the magazine is in this part. This special arm can pick up the holder in and out this way. And then once it pick it up and retract to this position, the magazine can go up and down. It can go down to different slots and you can deposit a cartridge, move to a different position, pick up another one, leave it up and drop it to the column. So this is the working procedure of sample exchange. This is actually the last slide. So I want to clearly define several tasks, and then I can demonstrate those tasks on the computer remotely. So task one is beam alignment. Based on the situation, it is recommended to do this on amorphous carbon. So if you don't have amorphous carbon, you can do amorphous silicon or silicon oxide, which is not perfect, but it probably also work sometimes. So we prefer to use amorphous carbon or use another sample if it's available in the microscope. So how you do it, you first need to find the beam on the CCD camera. It's similar to other microscope, right? You need to see the beam and then you can align the beam. And then after you see the beam, you can start to align the beam following the procedures shown on the tuning panel. So there is a tuning panel on like clearly defines what you need to do. You just need to be familiar with it. And then after beam is aligned, you need to tune aberration and do stem imaging. So you need to set up the tuning condition, which means the condenser 
angle, like 33 milliradians or 19 milliradians, you change to the setting and then set up the defocus because the distortion of the image by aberration is defined by both defocus and the angle. So you click measure button to measure the aberration values and then fix it by choosing to fix the values. But they don't normally fix by one cycle. You need to measure fix, measure fix like several cycles. And finally, when it's fully aligned or aberration fully tuned, you will see a liquid feature in the raunchy gram to confirm it is good. And then you can move to the sample to take beautiful images. Text three is, so if you want to do EOS, you want to do beam alignment first, do aberration tuning first, and then choose EOS mode, choose the dispersion, align zero loss position, tune EOS aberrations. Um, some basic ones, if you just uh, do colors use, and then you choose the energy range you want to measure, and then you finally acquire data. So those are the basic procedure, which you, you can see that is quite similar to other microscope, but the only difference is the user interface. So with this slide, we will finish the slide training part. Now I will remotely log into the microscope to give you some detailed introduction. Okay, so the password is ASTAG. Uh, suppose you are sitting before the Nile microscope, you see exactly the same. The only difference is your mouse now cannot control it. Um, but actually I, I can give you access, but yeah, probably you don't need, you can do it this afternoon. Uh, okay, so this is the Internet Explorer showing those cameras. Yeah, you can see that the, the camera is still showing the beam, which means I didn't configure the monochromator slate in the correct position. Before we really do experiment, we need to change it to the correct position. So for now, I click out, you can see beam will be gone. Yeah, so because the camera is no longer in the beam pass. Okay, so we minimize it and try to align the beam. Okay, right? If you, yeah, I will send a copy of this slide back to you later. So I'm trying to uh, align with some procedure menus. So I just summarized task one beam alignment. So actually we have a in a user shared uh, folder Actually, there is some Word document I can quickly show you uh, of task one beam alignment. There are some uh, similar stuff showing those windows and showing you what it means and a step to step by step uh, guide. So you can read those later, but now you can, uh, since this video is recorded, you can also watch this video later uh, by yourself. So I have collect the beam, you can see the beam has been on for one and a half hours. So you can see that the beam is no longer in the optimized. So I, now I want to click flash now to improve the beam current. How do I do that? So I move the mouse here and left click and watch what's happening. So you can see the beam is no longer showing on the Rangi camera because it is stopping the extraction voltage. So it's no longer emitting current. And then after its current is stopped, it will pass a heating current to the tip to heat it up to remove contaminations. So would you recommend doing the beam flash just at the start of every session to be safe and then starting the every hour procedure? Yeah, you definitely want to do flashing at the beginning of your session and exactly the time before you want acquired data. You don't right. necessarily need to flash the beam for just the alignment. So I just okay. want to show you this procedure, but it's not necessary because for alignment, we don't need this. I want you to read, you can see there's a gun whack here. 14 pico tall, so that's the good range. So when the vacuum is bad, you need to pay attention to it. Um, okay, so I want to create a new library, right? So because this library contains data to other user, um, so we want to click create project. 
So I can create a lab in your name. Oh, uh, okay. I need to create a new new folder. Okay. Oh yeah, no, not this, but this. So I need to go out, new folder, Patrick. Enter. Okay. So it's under your name, and I select this folder. So I have. Uh, you can see it automatically generate a folder name. Then you can add some information to this folder name. Training on a CTS code. Okay, and then you click create product. You can see this is the position, this is the new folder, create project. Okay, you can see the, the former project is closed. And now you can see a blank project. That is the default look of this blank product. Normally at the beginning of the session, you want to split like at least top and bottom. And then the top part is left and right. And you can choose right and say, okay, I want to look at Runty camera for now. And you click play, you see it, right? And now you can see the beam. Normally I would say, especially for, for fresh users, the only thing you want to check is whether the beam is blocked by the holder. So let me show you. The holder can block the beam. Let me move around. Okay, now the holder is blocked by the gray bar on the copper grid, right? So when you click beam on, you don't see anything, right? That's the only occasion you need to worry about. So normally when you first load your cartridge, you tap in a larger defocus like minus uh, one, five and four zeros. Go to a large defocus and then just move around and then you will start to see the beam. Okay, if that's not the case, normally you need some help from the manager or some experienced um, colleagues, yeah, or other experienced line users. That's the first procedure, find the beam. So you need to see the beam. So if you don't see the beam, even after moving around over a large distance, something is wrong, you need to report as uh, a fresh user. Okay, now suppose we already see this beam. What we want to do is we want to officially start to align this beam. So you want to look at those task bars. You can see this is a long horizontal task bar here. And then the important controls are hidden here, MC alignment tools. If you open this window, you will see a lot of procedures. Uh, okay, I close it. Where you find it, you go to this monochrometer section, MC alignment tools, click. I will show this window, okay? And then it shows you a step-for-step -step alignment. Okay, so this is just to the alignment, but you want to say, okay, is there a requirement for such alignment? Yes, so you want to see the effect. What will define the effect, right? Here I want to emphasize defocus because the rangigram is changing over defocus, right? Currently, you don't see a difference in the rangigram because your defocus is so far away. So first thing you want to get to focus. And then actually you can evaluate uh, things. Oh, okay. So you can use the keyboard on the microscope, the up and down arrow, if I change, click up, you can see the strength is 10 micrometer. If I click down, it's one micron. I want to change to 0 0.1 micron. And then I use left and right to change this value. You can see the defocus is changing and the rangigram is being changed. It's when we go closer to defocus, it's looking like the image is being magnified, right? So I want to go to close to the defocus and now you can see we are very close. Okay, so some 
somewhere like here. And then I click stop, I click enter, or I left click, it will stop. And then I want to define this as the zero focus, at least for now. So you can define it by right click this number, right click, and you can see like now to target, it will now to zero. Okay, and then actually I want to go back a little bit. I want to go to a minus 1,500 nanometer defocus. So I have a portion of field of view. Uh, you can see this is a CDS go sample. You can see a lot of gold particles. Okay, now we are talking about beam alignment. If I look at this after, it's kind of a squeezed, right? So you can easily tell, okay, this after is not, um, not round. Should it be round? No, actually this is a, model parameter after it should not be perfectly round. It should be under a certain condition. So now let's say, normally we don't need to worry about MC1QX. You can see it's like blinking to a, to a sharp line. That's a good condition for MC1QX. And then we click this MC11QX. So I want to say, when you click this round icon, it just wobbles something. What is being changed? It's MC11QX element is being changed in up and down fashion. So you can say when they change this, after is moving up and down. Do you see that this after is moving up and down? Mm -hmm. Okay, so our idea of doing this procedure is to make sure this after is not moving up and down. So I will say, okay, let me give it a try. So you need to be very careful about the strength because this value is very sensitive. So if you can say I click up arrow, I change magnitude to one milliamp and I tap left arrow by one click, beam is gone, okay, uh, a disaster. So we don't want to do that. But the good thing is if you change it very badly, you, you click ESC on keyboard, it won't store the change. So you can say, I didn't change anything. I just click ESC, it's back. Okay, that's good. So you want to make sure the strings is in the right range. You can make it the very small where you don't see any change, then you, you say, okay, it's good. I increase it by 10, then you can see the effect. And you can see that I want to move it to the perfect condition. You can see now it's moving sideways, but not in, in a direction. So this, there is, there is a direction is, close to this way, this is the X direction of the monochromator. So we'll, we want to make sure it is not moving along this direction. You can see it's moving perpendicular to this X direction. We don't care about that, so that's good. Okay, so we are done with this 11 QX alignment. Any questions? Do you know what is the criterion we are looking for for this procedure? So what we're looking for is for the field of view to not be moving along that line you've drawn for the X. If it's moving perpendicular to that, it's okay for now since we haven't done Y alignment. Okay. Yeah, so for this alignment, we are just aligning X. So yeah, moving along Y is okay. So, okay, we can move on. High voltage fine. Yeah, so this is the voltage. It's an alignment that is not um, linked here. It just showed you the effect. So you can ignore that because it won't give you options for you to update the instrument. So you jump to the next one, okay? So you can say when you wobble this 21 QX, you can see the beam is moving around. So um, uh, when we do this alignment, we are actually looking at the image in 
in the Ranchi ground, we're looking at how those gold particles as moving. If you have gold particles, but if you don't have gold particles, you're looking at the amorphous carbon, how the amorphous carbon is moving. That's something you look for. But normally we can also tune it to make sure this monochromator after is going through the VOA after. We can do it both ways. We can either looking at the gold, just go here. Um, yeah, because it's so uh, off, right? You don't see clearly something. So, but you can roughly see it should be somewhere here, right? For, for this procedure of alignment, um, it's roughly there. Okay, let's go there. And let's see if the VOA is here. Now we want to put VOA in and see if VOA is there. Okay, unfortunately, VOA is not there. So we, we need to change this. For, for now, I want to take MOA out because I want to see a larger. Oh, okay. You can see VOA is here. MOA, we moved MOA there, right? This is the MOA current location, and this is the current VOA location. So these are very off. So actually, this condition is nearly on the edge of where you can tune this. So it's good to know, but usually you should not be in such bad conditions because I didn't pre-align this microscope before this training session. So that's why you see it's in a very bad condition. Uh, but it's also good for this training. You have access to this um, uh, additional information where I do this alignment at very, very bad uh, conditions. So normally for, for, for every microscope, you want to define a particular line, optical line, we call it optical axis, right? If we want to align every, we want to first align beam to this optical axis of all the optical elements. We also want to align the apterous centering on this uh, virtual optical line. So we want to draw a circle here and then go to edit, align circle to center. So this is the center of the CCD because we need to define something we can align, right? So Neon company recommend using the center of the CCD as the center of the virtual optical axis for this alignment, okay? So we have this circle. And then we start to move the control related to the C3 constant power uh, a wobbler, and then we try to move it to the center. Okay, and you can see that there is some light and we want to move this MOA position. We can wobble this and bring it to this VOA position like this, moving 11 DX, okay? It's still not enough. Uh, Okay, now we are nearly there, okay. Okay, now I think we are roughly aligned. You can see the beam is okay. The wobbling position is here. And then we go to the next one. You can see, do you see the effect? I'm pointing the center of the expansion and the shrinking of the uh, gold particle images. Mm -hmm. And I want to align this position to the center of the VOA. So I want to change VOA so that those wobbling center is the center of VOA. Um, okay, do you follow me? I mean, do you see the wobbling center is the center of this after now? Um, yeah. Okay, I can move it off far off, right? You can see the effect. You can see that the center is here while the center of the after is here, right? So I can bring it back so that it's aligned. Okay, now it's aligned. 
uh, and then I want to move this wheel A to have the same center with the circle I have drawn on the CCD. So, okay, now it's uh, aligned, okay? So I want to stop wobbling. And if I put the wheel MOA in, you can see MOA is still off. So I want to move MOA, okay, it's okay. Okay, now MOA is roughly aligned, but MOA shape is not perfect. So that is the following alignment. So now I want to align MOA shape. So I want to take VOA out and I click this MC11DX. If you see that the gold particles is moving along this line, which is the X, that is wrong. We wanted the gold particles to be stationary along this line. Do you see the improvement? Mm -hmm. They are much more stable. I, I can go back. You can see the gold particles are moving around along this X line. We want to minimize the, that movement. So we change this control. Okay, at least now I think there's very, very little movement. Okay, so now we want to address the Y control using this, this one. We want to minimize the movement in a Y. In a yeah, in a perpendicular direction. You can see uh, if it's exaggerated, right? You can see it's large movement along the Y, mm -hmm. and then we gradually minimize it. Okay, it's uh, almost perfect. Yeah, and then you want to stop wobbler because the movement is. It's clear if we reduce the defocus. So I want to change to a smaller defocus. Okay, and see how I can judge the movement now. You can see I can see some movement along the X. Yeah, so I, I, I can better tune it by using a smaller defocus because um, the movement is exaggerated at a smaller defocus. Okay, now I think this is nearly perfect. I just want to finally tune this Y. Okay, perfect. Now I think I'm done with tuning the, the ship of this MOA. And you can see that MOA position is off center a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I want to put VOA back in and move MOA relative to VOA. So the idea is we want we don't want to see the edge of MOA showing on the VOA. Okay. Right now is good. Okay. So there is a final core QH. This one is aligning the the after, right? If you can see the after monitoring the after movement, right? It's a Center and off center. Do you see that? Uh, I can draw. I mean, we are looking at the two extreme positions uh, of this. Uh, okay. Yeah, I draw two circles. You can see under two extreme conditions, those two circles don't overlap. So the idea is to make those two circles uh, not a circle anymore. It's actually a, a distorted version. So we want to make sure they overlap as much as possible. So now it's the perfect case, right? You can see this is aligned. Okay, I can show you how it looks like if it's off line again. You see the effect? The after yes. is jumping um, and don't overlap with each other in the extreme case. And now, right, in the extreme case, they have nearly the same center. So that is the condition we want. Uh, for this alignment. Okay, so, okay, good. Um, I can remove this. Okay, now I want to make sure the focus is still correct. So I want to go to real zero defocus. Okay, 
Um, now we can choose to hand tune or not do hand tune. So I prefer to correct the hand tune, the astigmatism to make sure the, um, the rangigram looks um, liquid-like and, and a zero, and a zero defocus. You can see the change in the rangigram when I change astigmatism, right? Do you see that? Yes. Okay, good. I can tell it to be zero for all those values. And then I tap in a defocus of minus 500. Okay, I only see a few gold particles. Okay, so that is good. So I want to go to check this final one, OL defocus. The idea is the, the shrinking and expansion center should be close to the center. So it looks good, it's close to center. So basically we are done for now. Uh, so this is one cycle. You might want to check another cycle when you do some change, right? But it's not necessary. So we want to click off and close this panel. Now I want to do aberration tuning. Uh, five, minus 500 is probably small. I want to do minus 800 and find the panel for the aberration tuning. Auto stem X, that's aberration tuning panel. Okay, go to advanced, okay? And then choose matter order three and maybe lower this because we are in the 19 Valerianis mode. You want to match the tuning to this value. Okay, that's too small. Okay, uh, maybe, okay, this is good. Click this is matter, click it. You can see the, the beam is being shifted quickly and then images are taken. Then you can see the output, click output. You will see the coefficient values here, right? Do you see that? Yes. And then you have the correction button. You can def define how much you want to correct. On the left side is the lower order aberrations. On the right side is higher order aberrations. So, you click this one, it fix only the lower outer average. You click this one, you only fix the higher outer average. So they are separate. So normally on a mode setting, we don't take stamp atomic images. We, we only need to deal with the lower outer. So I click lower order and matter again. Yeah, I will change to a higher convergence angle for measurement because I want to show you some um, atomic resolution images of the gold particles. Okay. So I measure fix, matter fix, so I did twice. So normally when it's working perfectly after twice, two measurements, it should be uh, very good already. So it should be very liquid. You can see the rangigram is okay, but there are still some aberrations. That's fine. So now because we are fresh on this, mode, this 100 kV mode, I mean. So not only we want to marry the probe, so we marry the probe okay, aberration again, we want to marry the aberration in the monochromator a little bit. Although we don't need to do phonon stuff, we, we also want to marry aberration. So I measured probe aberration, correct. Then I click monochromator aberration. So this is a measurement button. You click, they take images. And then they will output the values. Okay, now you will see the name is different, right? The name is slit. It means okay. the aberration in the monochromator. And then you can click fix. Correct. Uh, you can see when you move your mouse here, I'll show you some hint of what's happening. Correct aberrations up to first and second order. Okay, click. And you can see the beam change a little bit. Okay, so that's good. So we marry the probe aberration again. So we normally want to measure the probe, fix probe, and then measure the monochromator. So we uh, we measured the probe aberration, we fixed the probe aberration, then we measured the monochromator aberration. Now. I want to fix monochromator aberration. 
And then we can look at those values. You can see that these are okay, not very big, so that's good. So we'll do a final cycle and finish this part, yeah. We want to go to 100% for the probe aberration. So let's yeah. measure again. You can see there is a percentage. Normally I look at the percentage. I want to make sure all the controls to be, um, okay, actually after they are 100%, now in the new version of Swift, it shows done. So it will tell you it's good now. If mm -hmm. not good, it will show you like 80% something. So, so normally you are looking for 100% because you can always change the astigmatism. So you, you worry less about this. You worry about all the other values. They should all be 100%. Uh, okay, so let's click this and measure the uh, monochromator aberration for the last time and see how it is. Okay, perfect. So we don't need to worry about this. Before we jump to the mode, we, we do atomic imaging. I want to quickly go back. This is still good. This is good. This one you need to put uh, VOA in. Okay, it's still aligned and put this in. Okay, so a tiny amount of movement along X, right? Uh, so I want to change it a tiny little amount. Okay, and then check this one. Perfect, this one. Okay, it's off again. Uh, this is normal because after aberration correction, right, you change some coma, so this alignment may be changed. Okay, now it's perfect, okay? Do, do you see that? Um, okay, so I can see you are following the logic. Now we want to switch to a high resolution mode. Okay, let's do a high beam current because we're looking at go. We don't worry about beam damage. So uh, let me think. Okay, maybe we use a lower current mode because even you're not damaging it, you will see a lot of uh, single atom movement. So let's do a low current mode where you give less energy to, you give a slower energy to the go. So they're more stable, yeah. So I always prefer lower beam current. So you can see the probe size is larger, right? So we need to draw a larger circle. So, and then make sure they still align to center. And you can see this circle, this probe after is not centered. So we need to go to this panel. As I said before, for the 33, you need to use this panel to tune the probe, okay? So you use after AB to make sure this after is centered with the reference circle. Okay, and then you want to open this panel and wobble call QH. Call QH, okay, you can see this overlap very well, so that's good. Okay, now we are done with this part. We put it here and then we change the focus. Okay, you can see aberration is very bad, right? Okay, mm -hmm. so we roughly see the crossover where the distortion go to a perpendicular direction. We define that as zero. We go to a larger nine hundred um, nanometer. Actually, you can hand tune because those gold particles should be round, right? So they're not round. You can easily um, just roughly tune those to make them round. Uh, it will make the system convert faster. Okay, we roughly tune and then we click matter. Before we matter, we want to say, okay, I need to change the tuning parameter because the convergence sum angle was changed. So I want to change it back to 70, okay? And then I click matter. You can see the gold particles is being moved around. The beam is being tilted. And then you can see the values. Look at those values. If you look at the status, it's very low. 
like yeah. 18 percent uh, less than 30 percent okay so that this means it's bad so normally we want to click the lower order because lower orders is more important so we click lower order you can see the beam is changed by a lot and then mirror again. So we want to make sure lower order values are close to 100% and then we click the third order. Okay, we see a lot of 100% so we, we can start to correct. If you look at this residue, right? Look mm -hmm. at this number. I click set order, it changed once, but it, it does not change to zero. I click again, it reduce again, but not zero, okay. I finally click, it, it's zero now, but uh, you can see that if we go to zero, you can see there are still some lower order aberrations. So we can put some hand tuning here to make this process faster because we can easily change astigmatism based on our eye. It will be very fast and accurate. So this is some little trick. You can also not do this and depending on the software to fix this, but um, it, it, it will can work finally, yeah. So, but doing some human intervention just make this process faster. Uh, okay, let's look at the value. You can see the set order are still not good. And low order is also affected. So you can see the rest of error. Lower order is very large. So you fix that and try to fix, try to make sure it's below 100 for this value. And then try to measure again. Yeah, those are just my experience. In principle, I don't see any uh, special stuff. You just need to constantly fix lower order and higher order. Um, yeah. Just make sure the values are meaningful because sometimes the values are the totally wrong. So you just want to forget about those and do another measurement. As long as they're reasonable, you can just keep continue measure and fix. Um, you can see high order is done already. Okay, so that's good. I still want to click it once. Okay, but don't click to zero. I want to focus on lower order now. So, okay, you can see all the higher orders are done. So we click lower order again, mirror again. So run to camera time, oh, maybe 100. If you increase the exposure time of the CCD camera, you make this image sharper so the measurements are more accurate. But you can see we use the 50 before it is still converging. So there's no thing that low exposure time won't work or things like that. It's just affecting a little bit. And you can see we are already, already done. So all 100% showing good stuff. So we can finally confirm by typing zero and see the liquid-like feature on this Ranchi gram. Yeah, you can see that there are still some astigmatism showing as line features. So you can give it a hand tuning with very tiny step size. Um, I want to change this one also. Okay, some somewhere here. Okay, now let's try to do a final measurement after hand tuning measure. Okay, you can say all the other controls are 100% except the astigmatism. 
Okay, so I think we are done for now. Let's check the quality of run to QAM. Okay, I think it's perfect. Okay, now we can move this window to the other side, move this to the other side, move this to the other side, and I'll right click this part and choose HADIF. Make sure HADIF is inserted. If it's out, right, it's out. It will be gray and you click, it will be this light blue color. And this PMT, uh, this plus and minus sign is changing the gain of the PMT detector. So if you click scan, it will show something, okay? It shows something. Uh, super scan control. So you can say those are the parameters. So scan profile, Puma, Rabbit, and Frame is just to store a different setting under those names. For example, for Puma, it can have take time, pixel time is four microsecond, frame is 512 by 512, field of view is 1000 nanometers. So we want to go to atomic, so we will first reduce to, actually, if you go to very large field of view and go back to um, to this small field of view, there is uh, some residue error showing as coma. So, um, so sometimes you want to remarry the aberration again to remove the effect from field of view change. Okay, so now field of view is small. I want you to go to minus 600 and stop scan and measure aberration again to evaluate how large has the aberration been affected. Because I changed field view from 1000 nanometer to 16,000 meter. Okay, you can see you have a little bit coma uh, C to one B, right? That is the effect I was telling you about. If you change the field of view from very large to small or from small to large, you will have coma change. So you want to correct and measure again to make sure that effect is removed. So let's show some beautiful atomic images now. So I'm looking at uh, gold particles. I want to change the focus to show the lattice fringes. So actually there are different ways of doing this. Some people prefer um, a large field view like 64 and do a FFT. And then you can see the, see the diffraction pattern if you are um, aligning very well. And tune the astigmatism based on those diffraction patterns. Um, to make those diffraction patterns sharp. That is one way of doing it. Uh, or you can zoom into a single particle and try to tune up the fringes. Yeah, I personally prefer it this way uh, because I can see it easier. I'm changing the astigmatism by hand to make sure the atoms are showing as sharp points. Okay, now I think it's good. So let's change it to 4K.
you can see that um, when we move around, the defocus will change a little bit. It's the carbon frame. Uh, the carbon film is not so flat. So there is some bending and some other effects. So in the end, you need to optimize both the focus value and astigmatism to get the best uh, spatial resolution. Okay, so let's change to this one, to this one. Okay, let's try to, if you click this button, it will show some um, profile, go to profile, you can see the frame. Frame is actually what's happening, what what the parameter you use for acquiring acquiring data. Okay, let's change it to 32. And we, uh, when you click record, it will use the, use the setting in this frame, okay? I click frame. Let's see how it looks like. Okay, it's done because we are using a very low beam current mode. We don't see, um, um, we need a longer time. You can see there are single gold atoms dispersed on the uh, carbon support. Yeah. Okay, so here we are done with the demonstration for atomic imaging, for tuning aberrations, and then take ADF images. Okay, now I want to simply introduce to EOS. So we click EOS, and we'll change the mode into EOS. You can see the CCD is not showing the camera anymore. I want to split the bottom region to top and bottom and show the EOS camera, shows EOS camera and click play. Um, normally you will see something and you click capture. It will show the spectra. This is the image on the CCD. So this is integrating vertically. So this is the basic alignment pattern for EOS. So you can use zero P at Higher to move the zero last peak position towards the. It's it's changing very slowly, so I want to make sure the exposure time is correct. Okay, it's 500 millisecond, 100 millisecond, so it's refreshing much faster. So I can see the change very quickly. Okay, so. FY is changing the rotation of the beam, okay? So you want to rotate it to be vertical. Okay, now it's vertical. And FX is focusing the beam. So you can say when you focus the beam it appeared to be sharper on the right on this side. Okay, now we want to say, I want to see uh, the carbon, right? Um, probably we already see the carbon. So I just need to type in a longer acquisition time. Let, let's see, two seconds um, and see how it looks like. You can see. Okay, carbonate, right? This is the carbon decay edge. Okay, so you see the carbon decay edge. Now, since we're looking at gold, I want to show you something like gold. Um, let's say I go to 2000 EV. And I just want to, because the signal to noise ratio is not very good, 
I want to acquire 10 frames for 20 seconds. Also, I want to make sure I'm scanning over the useful region. So I will do a sub scan. So I only scan over this region, okay? And then you can split the window to left and right, and drag the sub scan window here. Oh, no, actually it's not sub scan, okay. It's a uh, sub scan is here, super scan H, AADF subscan. Okay, this you can see I'm only scanning over this region and I want multi acquire. So each frame is two seconds. I get two, uh, 10 frames, maybe, um, maybe 20 frames. Okay. Just want to show you something. Okay. Click start acquire. So you should spend time to get familiar to those windows. Um, I don't have time to cover all of those, but I cover the most frequently used ones. And then you can start to explore, like click what they are and try and see what's going on. Okay, yeah, it's all okay to try this Swift software. They won't damage anything. So you're welcome to try and take notes and ask questions. Uh, okay, so this is still going on. It's 40 seconds. So, during this time, I can quickly go through some of the panels. This is multi shift use acquire. So this is similar, but this is mainly used for acquiring peaks, including zero loss. It can automatically apply cross correlation and align zero loss peak position for you. Spectrum EUs imaging. Uh, this is doing mapping actually. I can show a mapping to you later. Auto tuning, this is aberration tuning. Dactris camera control for changing parameters of Dactris camera. I inspector, actually, this is important for each image you acquire, right? You want to change the information like name. So you click and click inspector and type in the name 001, like test. Yeah, something like this. Okay, so we can blank the beam for now and go to this image. So if you look at this image, drag it to somewhere, you can see this slide bar, it shows that you're, you're, you have a lot of data. So you can click processing, align, align sequence. You have two algorithms. We can maybe choose one of them for you. Okay, those are aligned and then processing sequence integrate is sum all of those together okay so this is the final spectrum uh final spectrum yeah okay we put it here you can see roughly here is a bumpy signal right this is the gold signal okay we can um um typing something like a gold this is gold okay so this is done for um, for this. Um, okay, now I want to do a quick use mapping uh, because go to signal is too weak. I will just do a um, carbon mapping. So I change back to zero so I can see a carbon. Uh, I can see something, okay. So I also want to collect data from this sub scan, right? You can see this is, oh, it has drifted. So we need to, uh, retake a survey image, right? We click, um, unclick sub scan. So you will start to show the survey image. Move this window off a little bit. Okay, draw the sub scan window. It shows, uh, it can be used as a region of interest, similar to Gatan Digital Micrograph. We go to this. We, uh, we need to enable sub scan. We define each pixel to be 50 milliseconds. And then we can define how many pixels you want to have for this box. Okay, so based on the survey image, you have 253 pixels. So let's do, we just want to do 25 pixels and each pixel is 50 milliseconds. Okay, so now you always want to check the EU spectrometer showing correct data like zero loss peak is aligned. Okay, now it's aligned. And then sometimes you, you forget the mode, you're in CCD mode, you don't have signal on the deck, on the deck trees and you play acquire, you record nothing. Those are some errors I made before. So you check the image, 
for region, check signal on the factories, everything looks perfect. And then now you click acquire and you will wait. And you will see the scanning process that will show up here um, somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, we are almost done. After doing this, I will quickly show you some monochromatic use and then we're done for this part. You can take a rest and go on to the microscope for practice this afternoon. Okay, okay so yeah, I think you already maybe pra uh, practiced the data processing a little bit, but I can quickly show you, um, yeah, but not, actually data processing. We still do a lot of processing using digital micrograph. Uh, okay, so let's look at this uh, data set here. This is the spectra use we acquired from mapping signal. So we can um, process, select, reduce, pick some. So we will pick a region from this window. I see the spectra, right? Um, if you look at this, right? We see the carbon, I see when we move around. So now we want to create a background removed. Okay, let's remove the background. We draw a region and click use fit background. You can see that background is fitted. Okay, good. And then we have signal. Okay, use a map signal. Okay, we can do a signal map. Okay, here. Yeah, this is the map of the signal. Um, yeah, it's better to process it in digital micrograph because um, this uh, is not very um, well designed, but it provides you some functions already. Okay, now let's do some quick test on monochromatic use. We see a generally uh, broad beam, uh, which have a um, you know energy spread of, of about 0 0.3 eV or 300 milli electron volt. Um, so, okay, let's go back to this normal mode. So we start from the normal mode. Uh, for example, you see uh, the electron beam on the Rangigram CCD. And then you try to align a little bit. Um, actually, those are the prerequisite for this part, for high energy resolution. You should align the beam at the very beginning, but over time, the alignment will be off, so you have to recheck um, everything to make sure everything is optimized. Uh, especially this MOE movement is constantly uh, moving. Okay, so we make this stationary. And then uh, center it using this MSC 11 DX. Okay. And then you put the monoperimeter slit by clicking here, monoperimeter slit in. So if you click in, and you will see something is changing. Um, actually, when you take the slit in and out, you will see the counts will be very different. So for example, you click, um, left click and then press enter. You will see the beam clearly, but if you put in, you will see nothing because the counts are so low. You need to click and press enter again to see that. Okay, uh, after the monochromator slit is in, you want to take the VOA out and MOA in and look at the edge of the MOA. You want to uh, make sure the edge is clear. If it is not clear, how do you deal with that? You want to close and open the slit, try to find a good position where the charging is not so bad. 
So let's see. You will see now is the condition where the uh, monochromator slit is charging so bad that you cannot see a clear edge of the MOA. So how to deal with this? So we click open and we click close. We keep try uh, and try to find a range where it will uh, stabilize. Okay, so it looks like we need to open wider. Okay, now the edge is very clear. So now it's a good condition. Let's put VOA in and then switch the mode to use. And now you will want to make sure you're using the correct uh, use dispersion. So normally for a uh, very high energy resolution, you want to use one melee electron volt per channel, which is 0 0.001 EV per channel. And you want to make sure this is showing EOS ref, this is showing CL21 millimeter, this is showing 19 milliradians. And now look at the <clears throat> Detectors, which is the use detector, we are showing in two panels um, vertically. So if I click, they are the same. Actually, both these regions are showing the uh, image on the use detector, but we can choose capture, it will send the data vertically. So you can see a use vector. And you can see right now the um, peak wise is 25 millilectron volt. And if you look at the image on the Dactris camera, you will see they are um, uh, blurring. So that is because the monochromator slit is charging. So you can try to click uh, close and click open. And you exercise this uh, until you see uh, you know, a good region where you know it's not charging. Uh, you can observe this by looking at the peak wise uh, on the use detector, or you can look at the CCD camera when you um, put it on CCD mode. Um, both smart methods are working. Um, you just need to keep trying to find the best position of the uh, use slit. Okay, it looks like we are entering a somewhat uh, stable region. We're reading 10 or 11 millielectron volt OS half maxima. So this is good. And then we start to play with this panel, which is the EU's tuning panel. Uh, we can play with FY. Um, and make sure this feature is vertically uh, being shown in the line feature. Um, and then we can play with the C to, to correct the C shift. And then finally, we want to move the peak to the zero by using this ZLP tag. So we can, um, we can left click and use the left and right arrow on the keyboard to move this peak to the position. Okay, it is good. Um, it looks like the system is quite stable now. We're uh, constantly reading, you know, 10 or 11 melee electron volt for West half maximum or uh, resolution. So that is good.